All right, so let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to present Jean Calvet. Uh, go for it, and okay, please welcome him. So good morning, everyone. So my name is Joan Calvé, and uh, this talk is about how to build a multi-architecture disassembler. And this is a teamwork with my colleagues, uh, Nicola and Cedric. So first thing first, who are we? Uh, we are software developers working for a small company called PNF Software. And uh, our main activity is to develop JEB, which is a reverse engineering tool. So to give you an idea, uh, in 2012, we released the version one, the major version one of JEB. At the time, it was only a decompiler for Android application, so it translates Android application back to Java code. Uh, it comes with an interactive UI, a scripting engine, such that the user can uh, analyze the application. And then a few years later, we released version two uh, with the ability to decompile uh, Windows Linux executables back to C code uh, for a bunch of architectures, including x86, ARM, MIPS, and uh, their 64-bit variants. And then a few years, uh, just recently, uh, in 2018, we uh, released version three, uh, which is also able to decompile non-native platforms, uh, for example, Ethereum contracts or WebAssembly modules. So we really uh, see Jeb as a tool that should allow the user to analyze uh, many different types of files. And um, in this presentation, I want to focus on one specific part of Jeb, uh, namely its native disassembler. So the, the word disassembler can mean a few different things. So what I'm talking about here um, uh, is a disassembler takes in input an executable file compiled by a compiler. So there is a x86 executable file uh, represented just by its uh, raw dump, an extract of its raw dump. And so this disassembler takes this uh, executable file in input, and it will tell you that uh, these red bytes here, these are executable code. And this code um, uh, constitutes a routine. A routine is the equivalent of a function in high-level languages. And the routine will be represented as a control flow graph, uh, so, which is a, a graph uh, where the nodes are called basic blocks. And each basic block contains a series of machine instructions uh, translated to assembly language, hence the name disassembler. And then there are some edges between the nodes uh, to represent the possible control flow graph. So the disassembler tells you that these red bytes correspond to this routine, uh, while these green bytes here correspond to these one node routines. So that's the kind of disassembler we are talking about here. They produce a global disassembled view of a program with all routines uh, that are uh, present in the executable. And the purpose of this view is to represent uh, the possible ways the program could execute at runtime. And note that uh, while it is an assembly-based view, so it is assembly language, the translation of individual machine instruction to assembly language is just one of the features. There are many things needed by disassembler in order to produce this global view. And speaking of that, why do we need disassembler? So first, they are useful because they provide a foundation for automatic advanced analysis, like the compilation to high-level language, like C or Java. Uh, a disassembler can answer, can answer questions like, where is the code, where are the data in an executable? Um, in which order instruction got executed, that's the control flow. Uh, how the data are manipulated, the data flow. They also build abstractions uh, useful for advanced analysis. So they group instructions within routines, within control flow graphs, within basic blocks, and they can also tell you that a certain series of bytes is a string, another series of bytes is a variable. So all this is needed for uh, automatic advanced analysis. But these assemblers are also useful for manual analysis because uh, their output can be directly understood by humans. And in particular, when the automatic advanced analysis fail, uh, the disassemblers are usually seen as providing the ground truth because they remain close to the machine. So you might know as disassembler uh, IDA Pro, Ghidra, uh, Banami Ninja, Radar2. So all these tools, they got their own disassembler engine within. And uh, in Jeb, that's the same thing. We got our own disassembler engine. Uh, that's the foundation for the decompilation we do. So to give you an idea, uh, when we open a binary in Jeb, we got a routine list, uh, that's the red, the red box. Uh, you see all routine, and for each routine, there is its control flow graph in the orange block. So that's the output of the disassembler, the control flow graph. And then the control flow graph is given to a decompiler pipeline, uh, which produces the C code, but you can see at the bottom in blue. But, so in this, presentation, in this presentation, we focus on the disassembler. And so most of the logic of a disassembler uh, is architecture independent. That is exactly the same code for x86 uh, or for ARM, for example, except for the instruction parsing and a few heuristics I will describe later. And as I said before, it can also parse non-native code. So in this, in this presentation, my intent is really to first talk about the problem, what makes disassembly hard uh, on several architectures, and then describe the way uh, we deal with those problems in Jeb. So hopefully you don't need to be a reverse engineer to understand what I'm going to show you. Uh, and hopefully we will show you what, what it looks like to develop a disassembler and uh, why disassembling remains actually a quite uh, complex problem. 
And as a small disclaimer, this is intended to be a research talk, not a sales talk. So I will show what, what is the current work in progress in JEB, and uh, it's not intended to be a final or best solution to this assembly. So first thing first, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a toy example that we, are trying, well, we will try to disassemble step by step uh, in order to build um, some kind of intuition about uh, what is this assembly and what makes it hard. So we will start with uh, this simple uh, C code. It's called secret C. Uh, here there is a main routine. Uh, it checks if one argument was provided, and if it's the case, it calls another routine called secret algo uh, with the argument passed in input as a string. Uh, so secret algo is, is here. Um, it computes the XOR between its argument, its string argument, translated to an integer, thanks to the A2I uh, library routine, and a constant named secret key that is defined at the top. So overall, the logic of the program is just to return the XOR of its argument with a constant if one argument was provided or zero uh, elsewhere. Now, if we take this C code and compile it with Microsoft Visual Studio x86 compiler without any optimization, so we end up with a Windows executable, we can execute it on a Windows machine, and as there were no optimization, this executable will be a literal translation of the C code, and in particular, the structure will be exactly the same as in the C code. So now, if we were to give this binary to a disassembler, we expect that the output should be something like this. Uh, there should be at least two routines, uh, one for main, let's say routine one is main. Uh, as in main, there is a test on the number of arguments. There should be two possible execution paths, so the graph should have two paths uh, for routine one. And in one of these paths, there is a call to the second routine, which is secret algo. And uh, so routine two uh, will have a very simple graph with a call to a third routine, A2I. Uh, we don't know where A2I is going to be. It's a library routine. It might be an, in an external file or in the same executable. And then there will be XOR with our magic constant. So that, that's a sketch of what we expect the output to look like if the input is a non-optimized uh, executable coming from this uh, C code. So now the question is, um, how do we get there? How do we, how do we transform the Windows executable into this global disassembled view with these two routines? So how do we build the box in the middle? So first, there are a few things that uh, we need to clarify, that we need to have actually to disassemble. Um, the first one is that we need, uh, to, so executables usually comes within executable file formats. If you are on Windows, it's a PE file. Li on uh, Linux, it would be ELF, uh, Mac or on Mac. So these executable file formats, they provide necessary information for the disassembler. And uh, for example, if uh, we give our Windows executable to a PE parser, the PE parser will decompose the structure of a file and provide an output, uh, first the memory mapping, that is it will tell you where the bytes in the file are located in memory. Uh, and this mapping is usually divided into sections or segments. And also it will provide us the entry point, that is the address of the very first instruction executed at runtime, and also some information on the architecture for which this file was compiled for. In our case, it's for x86, it's a little Indian architecture. So all this is going to be the input of a disassembler um, and not the raw file itself. Then there are, there are another thing that we need. We need the ability to disassemble individual machine instruction. So let's call this instruction disassemblers. Uh, so instruction disassemblers take in input a binary blob and they produce in output a parsed instruction. And this parsed instruction usually contains the mnemonic, which is the assembly representation of the operation, the operands, uh, register, memory addresses used by the instruction, and then uh, some other information, like for example, um, what are the next instruction to execute. So for example, if we, take, uh, if we give 55 in hexadecimal to an x86 instruction disassembler, it will tell us that it's a push and that it uses the EBP register uh, as, as an operand, and that the next instruction to execute is the fall through, that is the instruction just following this one in memory. Then if we give uh, four bytes uh, to the, these four bytes to the ARM instruction disassembler, it tells us that it's a sub, if not equal, uh, with two operands, L0 register, PC register, and the next instruction is the, also a fall through. Then if we take the same four bytes and give them to a MIPS instruction disassembler, it tells it's an over instruction, um, so it's branch if equal to zero, and there are two operands, a register and an offset, and as it is a conditional branch, there are two possible next instruction, the fall through if the condition is false, or the branch target if the condition is true. So um, we are going to need instruction disassembler for all the architectures we want to disassemble, of course. And note that the instruction disassembler do not tell us anything about what the instruction is doing. It's just providing a parsed representation that is human readable, uh, kind of. So that, for, for, for the sake of the argument, um, in this toy example, we are going to assume that we have a PE parser and we have an, instruction, an x86 instruction disassembler. And now we come back to the question, how do we get from the Windows binary to the disassembled view? So first, uh, intuitive strategy that you might think of 
is that we could start from the entry point, because it is provided to us by the PE parser, and just try to follow the code, try to follow the control flow, discover the routines, and build their graph as we go. So let's try this. So here, on the left, uh, I represented the input memory mapping, so that's the secret exe mapped in memory. The first column is the address in memory, then there are the bytes uh, located at this memory. Uh, we have an arrow on the next instruction to disassemble, a pointer to, an next to the next instruction to disassemble, represented by the arrow, and it's initially set at the entry point of the program. So we start from there, and we give the first few bytes to the x86 instruction disassembler. It tells us that it's a push EBP, uh, so we add this new instruction to a new graph into a new block, and the, the instruction disassembler also tells us that the next instruction to execute uh, should be the fall through, the one following this one. So we just increment the pointer, and we go on. We do it again, another instruction, we add it to the current block. Uh, the fall through is the next instruction, we do it again and again, and we end up disassembling a conditional branch. So GNZ stands for jump if not zero. So that's a branch, so we end the current block. Uh, it's a conditional branch, so there will be two, pos two possible execution paths at this point. So we have a choice to make. We have two possible addresses to analyze next. The fall through, if the condition is false, or the branch target. So here I decided to continue analyzing the fall through, so we store the target address for later analysis in a bucket at the bottom right. So that's an address within this routine that we store to come back later. Fast forward, we analyze the fall through, we disassemble all instruction, and at some point we end up disassembling uh, x86 call instruction. So this instruction is usually used to implement routine calls. So uh, we have the same situation here. There are two possible addresses to analyze. There is the call target, it's an over routine, and there is the fall through, when we will eventually come back from the call. So we do the same thing, we continue analyzing the fall through, and we store the call target for later analysis but we store it in a different bucket because it's not the same type of address, it's an over routine, it's not an address within this routine. We do, we do the disassembly again, and then we end up disassembling a RET instruction. So RET stands in x86 for return, and so return to the caller routine, so that's the end of the current block. So we have another address to analyze within this routine, so we go on, we continue disassembling on the next address that was previously uh, stored at the bottom right, and finally, we have no more addresses to analyze, we have a complete CFG, so the current uh, graph is finished, the current control flow graph is terminated, and we can go on uh, analyzing the next routine that we previously stored. So fast forward, we do it all again, and then we end up with these two routines. So routine one, which is, which is the main actually, has two possible execution paths. Uh, one is calling the routine two, and uh, routine two has a one node uh, graph, and there is a call, and then there is a XOR, so I've let a few details out, but you got the ID. What we have here is exactly what we expected. So we produce what we expected with a simple recursive algorithm just by following the code. And it seems that uh, all the magic was in the instruction disassembler, which was providing us, in particular, the control flow information for each instruction. So it seems that if you want to build a disassembler, all you need to have uh, is an instruction disassembler for the particular architectures you are targeting. Actually, during this step-by-step -step disassembly, we made a series of questionable assumptions, and I will now describe some of them. So the, the first assumption we made, and you probably noticed it, is that when we were analyzing the call instruction, uh, we assumed that the call always returned to caller. We continue analyzing the fall through uh, when we are analyzing routine one, we continue analyzing the fall through as if the call will eventually return to the caller. But in reality, there are a non-returning call. And there is no need to go far to, go to find an example of that. Uh, just looking at uh, Visual Studio C runtime code, which is statically linked in our Windows executable, there are calls to APIs terminating the application, so this call never returned to the caller. And the compiler knows it, so what it does, it puts invalid code just after the call in the fall through. So here you can see an int free, uh, it's a software interrupt, it should never get executed, and the compiler knows it. So for us, as disassembler writer, how do we know that exit process is never returning? It's actually in the, in the prototype of the routine. So if you look in the full, at the full prototype in the header file, there is an attribute before the classic prototype that tells us that this API never returns. And uh, note that uh, returning void and being non-returning are two different things. Another example are infinitely looping routines. And once again, there is an example coming from a classic compiler code, this time GCC. So this routine has no way to come back to the caller because uh, it has no way to come back to the caller. It's just infinitely looping, so it's non-returning as well. So now, if we think a bit about this, uh, so we need to identify these non-returning calls. Uh, otherwise, our CFG will be incorrect. We need to cut the blocks just after the call. 
For the non-returning external APIs, for like exit process, uh, we can identify them from their names uh, if we have access to their full prototype somewhere with the non-returning attribute. For the non-returning internal routines, uh, for example, imagine a, a small routine, a wrapper, just calling a non-returning API, uh, we can identify them by analyzing their graph. And if the graph has no returning blocks, then it is a no-returning routine. And this last bit uh, brings an interesting situation. We can only know an internal routine is non-returning after having analyzed it. But what if we are on a call instruction and we do not have analyzed the target yet? So we do, don't, we do not know at this point if the target is returning or non-returning. So we could stop analyzing the caller just here and go analyzing the callee first. But that could be tricky because we would have to maintain the caller state, and there, there, it can be difficult, if there is, especially if there is a chain of calls in the callee, possibly coming back to the caller, so that might be difficult to do. And often, we do not even know where the callee is. They are non-trivial call where you don't know the target, and I will show you an example of that later. So the way we deal with that in Jeb uh, is that for the external APIs, we have our own C parser, and we build what we call type libraries, uh, from compiler and SDK header files. So these type libraries, they provide for all the declared uh, function in the header file, they provide the full prototypes with the non-returning attribute. So we can just check for their name within the type library, and we got type libraries for uh, many major compilers and SDK. For the internal routines, so we try to identify the simple cases at the time there is a call instruction. So for example, we have a very simple binary check to see if a routine is just a trampoline, so a small routine going to an API, uh, so it's a trampoline to a non-returning API. And if it's the case, we stop analyzing at the call, we don't go analyzing the, the fault true. Otherwise, if it's a more complex internal routine, we terminate the caller analysis first, assuming the call will eventually return, exactly like we did. But then we analyze the callee. And if we found out that the callee routine, the call routine, is actually non-returning, we go back at the entry point of the caller, and we reanalyze the caller once again. So it can be tricky, because the first time we analyzed the caller, we were missing some information. We analyzed a call as being returning, and actually it wasn't. So it can be hard to undo. So that's it for non-returning. Call. Another assumption we made uh, during the step-by-step -step disassembly is that we assumed that the routine control flow graphs are distinct. And when we were uh, done analyzing routine one, when we have no more addresses to analyze, we consider it done, like if the CFG of routine one uh, was terminated. Actually, uh, in reality, there are uh, examples of routine sharing code. And once again, just in Visual Studio C runtime, uh, there is this, uh, these two routines here. So notice how the routine on the left is directly branching within the routine on the right. So why is it a problem? Let's say we pass the routine on the right first. So we build its control flow graph, its basic blocks, and then we discover routine two, we pass it, and we found out that there is a branch within an existing basic block. So the instruction in red here, they are shared between the two routines. So now the question is, do we split, uh, do we do, sorry, do we duplicate this instruction into a new block and we build a separate control flow graph for routine two, or do we split the block and have a new basic block that we share between the two routines. So first, to think about this, we have to remember that a basic block, the usual definition is that it is a series of instructions executed successively, and as such, it is a super useful uh, abstraction for later analysis, because we can process basic blocks without dealing with control flow changes. There are no control flow changes within blocks. There is an exception, exceptions. When there are exceptions, it breaks the flow within a block. Uh, but uh, let's forget about exception for now. And so, if we were to duplicate the instruction, that means we will duplicate the instruction uh, for a separate graph. That means at, at one address, we will have different possible basic blocks. And that will make the writing of later analysis harder because we will need to check all these blocks at the same time uh, when, we analyze, when we are at a specific address. So it's likely not a good idea to duplicate instructions if we want to keep uh, the powerfulness of basic block as an abstraction. So what we do in Jeb is that during the disassembling, uh, we build what we call skeletons basic blocks. So these are just containers for instruction, and they can be easily modified, splitted when we need. And then once we, all this assembly is finished, uh, we build the final control flow graphs with proper basic blocks and much more information inside. So that means that in Jeb, an address belongs to at most one basic block, and a basic, a basic blocks can be shared between routines. So if we come back to the previous example, in Jeb, a control flow graph looks like this for these two routines. There is a block that is shared between the two the two of them. Now, another assumption that we made uh, is, that, is that that branch instruction immediately, immediately end basic blocks. So when we were analyzing the conditional branch, we uh, ended our block at this conditional branch, uh, because that's the usual way, we, the usual thing to do with basic blocks. But when there is a branch, there are possible um, uh, control flow, so you cut the block at this particular location. 
There is one iconic uh, Kutter example of that. If we look at other architectures than x86, and remember we, we intend to build a multi-architecture disassembler. So there is uh, some MIPS code. So don't need to understand the, the snippet. I just want to focus on these two particular uh, branches. So these are conditional branches. They branch if a certain condition is true. Uh, otherwise, they go to a fall true. Now, the tricky part in MIPS is that uh, this red instruction here they will always be executed whenever the branch, the previous branch, is executed. So even if a conditional branch is taken and go elsewhere, the fall true instruction is executed. So that's called branch daily slot. It's actually a feature of MIPS, but also on uh, Spark CPU and uh, some DSP CPU also. Uh, so the, the, the story behind this feature is quite interesting. As you might know, um, modern CPUs, they execute instruction within a pipeline. So that means that when they execute one instruction, they load at the same time another instruction from memory. So there is a problem with conditional branches because um, the CPU doesn't know yet if a condition is true or not. So we have to make a guess uh, to load either the fall true instruction or the branch target instruction. So if a, and if a guess is wrong, there is a bubble and it has to empty uh, the pipeline basically and there is a loss of performance. So to solve that, uh, in MIPS there is this delay slot. The fall true instruction just after a branch is always executed. So they don't, they don't have any guess to make. And so it's the job of a compiler to actually use this delay slot and put some useful instruction with inside. So sometimes the compiler has no use of a delay slot, it just put an op. Uh, sometimes he actually has a use for the delay slot, he puts a valid instruction within the delay slot. So for us, uh, from a disaster perspective, what does it mean? Uh, let's focus on this particular block here. So there is a conditional branch here, so we have to cut somewhere a basic block because there are two possible uh, control flow uh, paths. Remember that a basic block is a series of instructions executed successively. So that means that the daily slot belongs to the same block as the branch because it is executed with the branch. But if we cut just after the daily slot, that means that we have now branch instruction in the middle of basic blocks. And that's basically breaking one of the most common assumptions on control flow graph and basic blocks. That means that is, uh, they end on branches. So a first idea would be uh, to try to avoid that, to avoid that situation and find a way to, to still have the branches in last position in blocks. So first, you might think that a CFG is just a representation, so we, might, we, we can play with it. What if we simply revert the instruction order? If we do that, uh, we actually break the order of expression evaluation, because the branch condition should, uh, must be evaluated first. So in this example here, according to the graph, uh, the V0 register, which is used as the condition in the branch, is now set to, the, to 1, thanks to the LI, uh, which is the delay slot. So it's no more a conditional branch if we revert the, uh, the two instructions. So that's not working. Another idea would be, OK, let's create some kind of artificial instruction that groups together the branch and the daily slot so we still have a branch uh, in last position. It's actually legal to have a branch directly coming from elsewhere on the daily slot instruction. So with this representation, we cannot represent that. So it's not working uh, as well. So as far as I know, there are no shortcuts. Uh, so, and that's what we do in JEB. We, we, we allow branch instruction to be in the middle of basic blocks, and that's the job of uh, JEB instruction disassemblers to provide the number of daily slot for each branch instruction. Because actually, there could be more than one. Uh, having just one daily slot instruction is just one of the, the feature of the architecture. That's the depth of a pipeline. So to give you an idea, there is a, a snippet of MIP assembly and the corresponding control flow graph. So you can see all the branches are now in the middle of the blocks or not in the last position of the block. Um, another very strong assumption that we made during uh, this step-by-step -step disassembly was that we can always follow the control flow. And in particular, when we were analyzing the routine call from routine one to routine two, uh, we store the target for later analysis, assuming that the target was known to us. In reality, as I said before, it's not always the case, and to illustrate that, uh, let's come back to the secret C example uh, we, with a slight modification. So I introduced a function pointer at the top, uh, so it's a pointer to a function with the same prototype than secret algo, and you can see in main, the function pointer is set to the address of secret algo, and then we call secret algo using the function pointer. So it does exactly the same thing as before, except that it uses a function pointer for a routine call. So if we take this C code and compile it with Visual Studio without optimization like before, and we disassemble it with our simple uh, algorithm that we showed at the beginning, um, we end up with only one graph. So one routine has been discovered only. And there is the graph, so that's the main routine. And notice how the call to secret algo is now an indirect call. So it is dereferencing a memory address and calling what is stored at this address. What is stored at this address is actually written at the top here. So that's the address of secret algo. And so the problem for our simple recursive disassembler is that it cannot follow the indirect call. 
because the instruction disassembler cannot find the target of the indirect call. It's not in the instruction itself, it's in the state of the machine, the state of the memory. So we need the value stored uh, at the reference address at the time the call would be executed. And in this particular case, we can find this value, this value uh, pretty easily just by looking at the previous instructions, and we will find out that there is a, a, a move writing at this particular address. So if we assume that no other trade is going to modify the memory between the move and the call, we got the final target. We got the indirect call target. Is it always that easy? Of course not. Uh, so for a less artificial example of hard to compute control flow, uh, let's use gem tables. So gem tables are used by compilers to, um, to implement switch statement from high level language when the case value are close to each other, uh, when there are few gaps between the case value. So for example, here is a, 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 C, a switch statement with all case value from one for, to 400. If we compile it with Visual Studio once again and we run our disassembler, we end up with this graph. Uh, so we are uh, obviously missing a lot of code here, or the case code actually. So what happens uh, is that there is a branch, an indirect branch, using a register in the computation of the address, the ECX register. And so this address here is a base address to an array of four byte addresses. And the ECX register is an index into this array. So the array of addresses, these are the addresses of the, of the code implementing each case. So it means that if we want to compute the control flow for this uh, particular routine, we have to find uh, what are the possible values for the ECX register? In particular, what we need is the maximum value, such that then we can read in memory the address of the case handlers and make the connection in the graph. And it's doable, because there is a check on the ECX just before and the block before that is actually setting a maximum value. So that's just another example of hard to compute control flow. There are many, many cases I could have shown, but you got the idea. So that brings us to the, um, a more general question how can we find the possible values for indirect operands? That is, the operands using register or memory address whose value is not in the instruction, but in the state of a machine. And we need it in particular for the uh, indirect branches to have a better control flow. That is, to have a better control flow, we need a better data flow. We could do some pattern matching uh, to solve specific cases. So for example, one given compiler will always use the same machine instruction to implement gem tables. Uh, so we could identify that particular situation and process it uh, with some specific processing to compute the control flow. Of course, it will not scale because we would have to deal with all compiler, all compiler optimization level, all architectures. So in the search for um, a more generic solution to that problem, what if we could simulate the execution of routines such that we would build the machine state, register and memory between each instruction? So then we could solve the indirect operands just by looking at the machine state that we have built. Uh, for that to be possible, for this simulation of code to be possible, what we need is the semantics of this instruction. We need to know what each instruction is doing so that we can update the machine state. As you might guess, it's not always doable. I will come back on this later. But really, the hard part for this to be even possible is to have the semantics of the instruction, what each machine instruction is doing. And luckily enough, we already have it in Jeb because we need it for the decompilation. So uh, let me introduce the Jeb intermediate language. It's basically a custom language, uh, so it uh, can be seen as a low-level imperative assembly-like language. Uh, so a program in JBIL is a series of assignments made of expressions, uh, and there are only 16 different elements in the language. And we use this language mainly as a way to express the semantics of a native instruction. So to give you an idea, there is a x86 instruction, it's a XOR between a register and memory slot, and then there is its translation. That's the semantic representation in the JEB intermediate language. So all the side effects of this instruction are explicit uh, in this representation. So that's what the instruction is doing. And this IL will be used during the compilation, it will be optimized and uh, most of the assignment will be removed because they are not used. But Let's stick with that. So we have the semantic representation here. As I said, it's a foundation for the JEP decompilation pipeline uh, because our optimization, they work on the intermediate language, and so they, they can be applied on all architectures that we want to decompile. The, the, the hard part is to implement the native to IL converter. And so we have one of them for each uh, architecture we decompile. So it's really a similar idea to compiler intermediate representation. As you might know, compiler, they uh, apply their optimization on intermediate representation, such that the same optimization can be applied for all high-level languages. So that's a, a similar idea. So we can, we can reuse this uh, intermediate language and the semantic representation we have for our current disassembly control flow problem. We could simulate the JEB intermediate representation to enrich the routine control flow. 
And that's what we do. So we take each native routine and we convert it into JBIL. So the, that, that gives us a CFG of IL statements. With no, we, we do not optimize it at this point because we want to be very fast. And so for example, that is the first basic block in uh, the CFG IL of the main routine in secret exe. So you see all the side effects here. And then we simulate this IL routine to build the machine state uh, at each instruction. So we start from a clean state with uh, pseudo realistic values in register. We allocate stack memory. And then the, the actual simulator, the implementation of a simulator is not so hard because we have only to handle the 16 different IL elements. And then we use these computed machine states uh, to solve the indirect operands and um, enrich the disassembly. So to give you an idea, uh, in JB, if we uh, disassemble this uh, secret C with function pointer, the uh, previous example, uh, JB, JB is able to tell us that the indirect call is going to a specific address, so we write it as a comment with the arrow, and so that's another routine that will be disassembled by JEB. And so the reason we solve this indirect call is because we can find out during the simulation that there is a write to this particular address just before. So it might seem magic, but let's not get our hopes too high. Uh, this kind of simulation cannot always work and because the, the simulation has to be safe. It can only provide reliable values to the disassembly engine because otherwise it would be too risky to use. So to give you an idea, if we take this free IL routine instruction, uh, there are two registers set to constant and then there is ECX register set to the sum of the two previous registers. So the simulation works on this case. It can provide us the final value for ECX register. But now, if we, switch, if we switch EAX to be a value coming from memory, so that's the, the, the syntax for, to read into memory, here, we, the simulation cannot provide us for sure the value of ECX register, because it cannot, it cannot know what is in memory uh, at the time EAX was, re, was uh, set. So it has to be a safe analysis. That means we provide values uh, for, for, for cases where there are no unknown inputs. So it can only solve simple cases, but in a generic way, in the sense that it works exactly the same for all the architectures for which we have native to IL converters. So now, we cannot always follow the control flow. So do we have another way to find this uh, secret algo routine that is somewhere in memory uh, without any cross-reference on it? And that brings us back to a very old question in program analysis, how to distinguish code from data in a program just by looking at it. In theory, that's a well-known intractable problem, like any interesting problem, so that's not really helping. In practice, what makes it a hard problem on most architectures uh, is that code and data on modern architectures uh, usually share the same memory space. Moreover, almost any series of bytes correspond to a machine instruction due to a fact that the instruction set encoding are usually very dense, very compact, so they use all bytes of value. So just by looking at a few bytes, you cannot tell for sure if it's code or data. But uh, in specific contexts, we can devise specific solutions. And to illustrate that, if I show you this uh, roadmap of uh, x86 executable compiled by Visual Studio, and if I ask you, is it code or data? If you are used to reverse on Windows, you might notice that these are this, uh, there are these three bytes at the beginning and uh, just after. So these three bytes stands in x86 for push EBP, move EBP, ESP. That's the classic Visual Studio routine prolog, the first two instructions of all many routines compiled by Visual Studio. Then there are two bytes here, uh, standing for pop EBP ret, that's the classic Visual Studio routine uh, epilogue. And then between these uh, two prologues, there is a sled of CC bytes, uh, standing for in free, uh, so that's the classic Visual Studio uh, padding uh, within code. So if you know the compiler, uh, you can say that it's very likely that this roadmap here is code with two routines, uh, because it follows the patterns and the structures of code compiled by Visual Studio. So that's the basic idea. And another example from a different perspective, here is the memory view of uh, x86 executable compiled by GCC. So we already identified in memory some areas with code, some areas with data. And then we ask, do these gray area, non-analyzed area, are code or data? Once again, if you know the compiler, it can help you answer this question because GCC for x86 usually does not mix code and data. So that means that the top gray area is very likely code and the bottom gray area is likely data. You got the idea? So that's what we do in JEB. We try to identify the compiler that serves to create the target, and then we apply specific heuristics for this compiler, in particular to solve the code versus data question. So we have a bunch of compiler identification rules. And here is an example of an heuristic that we apply. An unanalyzed address A will be considered to be likely code if all this is true. The compiler is GCC or Clang, the architecture is x86, there are no obfuscation malformations, so that's also a bunch of heuristics here that we have to check if there is something wrong with a, with a file. 
if A is within the code area, so code area is defined as the merge of all code section or code segment, depending on the file format, and uh, if all the bytes at A do not look like code padding. If all this is true, it's likely that A is code. Now, there is an interesting design question. If we use this kind of strategy, how do we integrate, integrate uh, such compiler-specific logic into a generic disassembler? So what we do in JEB is that for each compiler, we load different extension, and this extension, they will feed the disassembler uh, with the heuristics result. So for example, there are a few of the heuristics. Uh, we have, uh, it's, it, these are methods in one uh, JEB interface. So there is one method to check if uh, memory address looks like padding, another looks like a routine prolog, or if a specific instruction looks like a switch dispatcher. So the branch instruction uh, used uh, by a switch statement. And so the disassembler doesn't know which extensions are loaded in memory. So that's the job of another uh, component to load the suitable extension for this particular file. Of course, if this will not always work, our heuristics are going to be wrong. It can happen because we misidentified the compiler, because it's a new or old version of the compiler uh, for which the heuristics do not apply anymore, or because there are some obfuscation, uh, our, our manual checks do not uh, catch it. So what we have is some kind of feedback loop. Uh, we log the error we do during disassembly. So for example, if we try to disassemble a series of bytes and it's actually not a valid machine instruction, we log it. Uh, if there is a routine that we try to build and the graph is incorrect or weird looking, so we log it. And we count all these errors and when a certain threshold is reached, uh, the disassembler switch back to a safe mode when we apply only very conservative heuristics. And JEP is also an interactive tool, so in last resort, the user can tweak the disassembler decisions. Uh, another assumption we made during the step-by-step -step disassembly is that the instruction set uh, remains always the same during the whole execution. So the instruction set uh, represents uh, which instructions are available and uh, what, what is the encoding on this instruction. So I never said anything about that, but that was taken for granted. There is one iconic, again, control example of that. If we look at another architecture than x86 or MIPS, it's on ARM. So there is a snippet of ARM assembly. Uh, once again, no need to understand the snippet. There is a, there is a branch here uh, going to another routine, a free instruction routine. And so notice all the bytes of the routine on the left uh, follow a different pattern than the bytes of the routine on the right. So on the left, we got two bytes machine instruction mixed with four bytes machine instruction. And then in the other routine, we got only four bytes machine instruction. Because actually, these two are different instruction set. The first one is called TUMB, and it's, uh, orig it, or it was originally designed to be a compact version of the second one, which is the ARM original instruction set. And so, these are different instruction sets sharing the same encoding space. So that means that the same bytes will be decoded into different instructions. Now, the, the, the tricky part is that they can be both at the same time in the same executable. And so how does the CPU know which instruction set to use? Uh, in this case, it will switch from term to arm thanks to the BLX instruction, which stands for branch with link and exchange instruction set. So for us, what does it mean? It means that the, the instruction disassembler must handle all possible instruction sets for a given architecture. It also means that when we know an address is code and not data, it's not enough. We need to know the actual instruction set to use to disassemble at this particular address. And this information can come from various sources. It can be from the way the address is called, for example, the ARM BLX with an offset, the way the address is referenced, uh, for example, in an ELF file, if the symbol has the least significant bit set to one, it's thumb and not ARM, uh, if the address has a specific alignment, etc. There are multiple hints to solve this question. So in JEB, what we do is that we allow our instruction disassembler to handle different instruction sets, and the generic disassembler logic uh, updates the instruction set to use uh, in the instruction disassembler. And when we have an unknown code address, so we know it's code, but we don't know which instruction set to use, we try all of them. So we disassemble with all instruction sets at the same time, uh, in parallel, and we keep the best result. So uh, the best result is basically the instruction set that provides us a correct looking control flow graph. So once again, that's a bunch of heuristics. A final assumption we made and, um, is that all code matters. And this assumption was not, is not really the same kind of assumption, but basically we are missing something in our uh, simplistic disassembler. If you remember, uh, in this secret algorithm, there is this A2I uh, library routine that is called in the graph. So we are in the corresponding uh, CFG. We have a call for this routine. It's going in the same executable because this, routine, this library routine has been statically linked in our executable. So there is a, an overcall at the end. So actually, A2I is pretty complex uh, as a routine, but it's just the standard A2I routine. So that brings us to a very old problem in reverse engineering. How do we identify library routines? 
such identification is first is useful because it allows the user to read documentation, of course, rather than analyzing the code. And in the case of A2I, the documentation is quite straightforward. Then it also helps the automatic analysis, like the compilation, by providing precise information on a routine, and in particular, the prototype, which can be hard to guess sometimes. So uh, the compilers, when they provide these library routines, they provide them in their already compiled form within object files. And these object files are statically linked by the linker in the executables. And th these object files, well, they come with symbols, at least the routine names, because the linker needs the routine names to do the linking and to know in which object, which object file should be linked into an executable. So that means that the, the usual strategy to solve this problem is to take the library object files coming uh, with a compiler to generate signatures uh, and then use these signatures at runtime in the disassembly to identify library routines. That's what we do in JEB. So our signatures, they are composed of uh, features on one side. These are the characteristics of the routine that we use to identify them. And then there are some attributes. So that's the knowledge we have on the routine, the name, internal labels, sometimes comments. And then when we generate signatures for standard libraries, we select the features to be uh, such that the signatures will be false positive free. We only want to identify uh, this particular routine and we don't allow any variation uh, because we want to trust the signatures very much. So we use as features a custom hash computed from a routine assembly code. So using the assembly code rather than the binary code allows us to be independent from the endianness, which can uh, differ on some, uh, on some B endianness uh, architecture. Uh, we use also the names of the call routine, so that allows us to distinguish uh, two wrappers, so the two routines having the same code, but calling a different uh, routine. So we use the name of this call routine as a feature. It can also be a burden to use that feature because uh, it means that you have to match the call routine to match the caller. And then we add some additional features depending on the routine size, and the basic idea is that the, the smaller the routine is, uh, the more features we need to avoid false positive. Uh, in other words, the bigger the routine, uh, the most chance the hash will be enough to identify it. And as a final note, uh, what, when I talk about false positive, in this context, it means that the name given to routine does not represent the behavior. So the dummy example is that we can if we identify unlink as remove, it's not a false positive because these two routines have a similar behavior in similar circumstances and the same prototype. So that's not a false positive. So we got a bunch of signature libraries for uh, all our architectures and several compilers, compiler optimization level. So enough with uh, broken assumption. Uh, what's the point I'm trying to make? First, if we sum up what we did, we successfully disassembled uh, the Windows executable secret exe with a simplistic recursive algorithm, but we made a lot of assumption on the way. And then we showed that uh, these assumptions can be broken just by looking at standard compiler code. And I've never said anything about obfuscation, protection, packers. Uh, all the examples I've shown uh, came from a classic compiler code. And if you are a reverser, you probably have in mind a tons of our broken assumptions we made during the step-by-step -step disassembly, like for example, instructions do not overlap, code does not modify itself. So that's actually the way many obfuscation techniques work. They uh, break the assumptions made by analysis tools. So a first pessimistic conclusion would be that uh, there is no such thing as a disassembler able to correctly disassemble all programs for all architectures and compilers. And the intuitive idea I was trying to show is that there are actually very few assumptions that are uh, holding true on so many diverse programs. And if you are an academic, you could uh, make the connection here with uh, the Alting problem and its generalization, the Rice theorem, which basically says that um, there, there is no interesting properties on program behavior, but you can decide. Now, we cannot disassemble correctly all programs, but we might still be able to do okay on a subset of them. And that, that was what I was trying to show with the compiler heuristics. What we can do is try to understand the universe of program that we will try to disassemble. And we can do it by dividing this universe into groups uh, with the two following properties. There, there, is, there exist reliable ways to check if a program belongs to a group, and an interesting group has non-trivial assumptions that are true for the whole group. That's exactly the idea of compiler-specific heuristics, but you can be much more, uh, you can refine that, a specific compiler with a specific high-level language, a specific runtime, and then there is a group with some assumptions that you know are true uh, for this group. And when a program does not belong to a non-group, we just apply very conservative uh, assumptions. And what we want is really to avoid the common disassembler mistakes. So the worst mistake a disassembler can do is to disassemble data, because it has some kind of domino effect. It can work, as I said before, the encoding is, is built in such a way that it can actually work. And it will have a domino effect by creating wrong cross-references, wrong branches, and it will be hard to undo. Then there are code considered as data, that's also a mistake, and it's misleading for the user. And finally, we want to avoid missing code and data. 
So this process of building knowledge of the program universe uh, will be, uh, easy, is easier if a disassembler is coded in an informative way, that is, it explicitly reports when there is an assumption that is broken, uh, so no, no silent fail, no else missing, and then the disassembler can help the developer map the program universe by identifying as we go uh, new corner cases. So every time we open a new binary in Jeb, uh, we, got, uh, we can have an exception as developer saying, telling us that there is a corner case. And as we analyze new programs every day, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, cool to have this, this ability. And then, of course, we have to test your disassembler aggressively and on diverse sample set. So the diversity of sample set is kind of tricky to achieve uh, because most available executables you will find on the internet. You don't know the exact compiler version. You don't know the optimization level. So it's hard to classify in which group they will belong. So you have to do some, a lot of compilation by yourself. Um, and then, you, so you can obtain the ground truth to make the test from the symbols if you compile by yourself. Also, you can use already compiled binaries and just tr uh, do some differential testing. So you compare the output of your tool with other tools. And we do it a lot in Jeb. We compare with other disassembler or results. And finally, something that is needed given this context of uh, not able to disassemble all program, we have to empower the user to provide them the ability to review and tweak the assumptions made by the disassembler such that they can adapt the assumption for their particular cases. So that means that as developer, you have to uh, explicitly say, I made an assumption here, and I visit the assumption. And of course, uh, if there is a UI, uh, the user should have the ability to fix the mistake during the analysis uh, themselves. So hopefully, uh, this presentation convinced you, if it was needed, that uh, disassembly remains a complex problem. And uh, you might think that as there are new compiler versions coming out, new languages, that the problem uh, comes, uh, becomes worse and worse. Actually, uh, there are many novel anti-exploitation techniques that tend to make disassembly easier, in particular because they provide hints to distinguish code versus data. So for example, elf executable segments, all the code is put in a sp one specific segment. Uh, Microsoft Control for Guard provide all routine entry points. Um, so in the metadata of a file, uh, Intel control flow enforcement technology put uh, specific instruction uh, at, at the routine entry point. So all these provide hints to help uh, disassemblers. So that could be, uh, so that's why a disassembler becomes easier and easier. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, of course, uh, I will try to answer them. Thank you.